We have a special treat today. I've been waiting a year and a half to hear this presentation since I started, so ever since I met Henry. Um, so Henry's going to discuss the uh, first expedition that reached the South Pole via land. Um, in our conversation, via the first American, American sorry, first American expedition. Um, and Henry, if I, I, there's a number of photos. If you've ever gone to the, um, the uh, OSU has a, a knowledge bank where they post a lot of photos. And if you go to that, you'll see extensive photos that Henry's uploaded and have captions in it. Um, he's very good to, to copy edit everything I set out. I always feel good if I've actually been able to produce a document that he, uh, he's not able to find any. His writing skills are very good. And so he always catches little things. Um, but it's always a go-to place if you want imagery of expeditions to Greenland, Antarctica, or pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, a few interesting tidbits about him that I found. Um, he does have a scholarship named after him at, at Bird Polar. He also has a glacier named after him that feeds into the, the Bird Glacier in Antarctica. So you do have a, a, a link on Wikipedia. What's that? And also a mountain. I did not know about that. So he also has a mountain. <laughs> so you probably have a second post for that on Wikipedia. Um, and uh, officially, and, and I told him I'd have a, a hard time pronouncing this just because it doesn't roll off my tongue. He's a photogrammetrist. Um, so, <laughs> and uses images to create maps. Uh, Wes and I like to joke that if you ever see some of the images that he draws, he can look at a topo, an image, and trace a topo map, cross-hatch it, label it, and you'd think it came off a printer. In fact, sometimes we have to flip it over to look at the back to see if there's actually ink that's bled through to tell us he's penned it by hand. Um, your, your drawing skills are so good. And you can do that just by eyeballing it freehand. So with that, I'll turn the program over to him, and he has some phenomenal slides. I met Jason. Well, thanks very much, Jason, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's going to be, by the way, this is long before photogrammetry. I never, had, I don't think I had heard the term but back then. And back then being 53 years ago is absolutely appalling to me. <laughs> I have lived this long, <laughs> but also of interest, the reason I label it ancient history is because I figured that most of the audience would not even have been born when this uh, event took place. So uh, without further ado, let me go through the slides, and incidentally, uh, there is precious little science in this. It's strictly a slideshow, uh, uh, and well, to me, it was an adventure. So this is unfortunately uh, very hard to see, but this is in fact the original chart that was kept for navigation as we were making the trip. And um, I, I should say, before starting the explanation, uh, the presentation, that I had wintered over at Bird Station as an Aurora observer, and uh, I got out into the field a little bit the first season, first summer I was there. And so I was very eager to get on a field party uh, the, the second summer, summer 60, 61, and I buttonholed everybody I could uh, get a hold of, and I wrote radio messages to NSF and on and on. And in fact, I was told uh, maybe a year later 
one of the NSF people that I'd made a real nuisance of myself. <laughs> and, uh, the upshot, however, it was that uh, I am sure I would not have been invited to go uh, because of all this effort. What happened was that the Army Major who was in charge of this trip wanted to show that there was some science being done as well. And he had two empty bunks in the uh, sleeping wanigan. So he asked for two people to, to come, for two scientists to, to come along. And the University of Wisconsin sent, sent a uh, graduate student who was doing geophysics, gravity, measurements. <coughs> and because I had been pestering people, I got to go. <laughs> uh, so the trip from uh, Bird to Pole was depending on whether you believe me, or what I copied, of course, from the navigator, or whether you believe National Geographic magazine map, the distance according to the geographic was 806 miles. Uh, according to my, my diary, it was 829. Uh, the, we departed Berg Station, which is down here, and went along pretty much south uh, west, southeast, sorry, and uh, had to go around the Harlech Mountains, around the Thiel Mountains, and then once we got past that, we went more or less straight down the meridian to the pole. Uh, we departed on the 8th of December, 1960, and Again, depending on whether you believe the geographic or my diary, I have it the, the uh, 10th of January and the geographic has it on the 11th. And I think the reason for the difference uh, is because Bird was on uh, uh, 120 degree west time and uh, Pole station was on Greenwich time. So that explains that. Let's see what's there anything else there that I should tell you. Well, the, the uh, speed of the vehicles was very slow. This was, this was the purpose of the whole trip was in fact to transport two D8 Caterpillar tractors with uh, low pressure treads from Bird Station to the South Pole to be used uh, for construction. And these things were 30 some tons. So rather than disassemble them and fly them, uh, the Navy decided that it would be better to drive them. And at the same time, they had a little publicity uh, first American party to the South Pole. Uh, when I started out on this uh, quest to go, I, I tried to propose some things I could do on the Traverse, and I proposed weather observations as the first thing, and then the idea of doing some glaciological work came along. and. Dr. Richard Goldthwaite, who was the founder and at that time the director of the, what was then the Institute of Polar Studies, found out that I was going to go on this expedition. He happened to be there with a field party. And so he said, well, if you're going to go, you might as well do something useful. <laughs> and uh, so he, he dug a pit. Bird Station, two meter pit, 
and he showed me it's a sort of standard routine to do in a pit. And uh, I wound up doing 25 pits in the 34 days that it took for the trip. And uh, in addition to that, I, uh, we played, I shouldn't say I, because I didn't do it. One of the radio men who was driving the weasel did it, put out accumulation stakes every five <coughs> miles. And uh, <coughs> see how many there were. Just <coughs> yeah. Okay, 57 stakes uh, were put out. Uh, five mile intervals and 14 of those had a little board on the surface in order to be able to recover the, the surface in, uh, in that remeasurement. So here I am preparing the uh, accumulation stakes, uh, putting numbers, tags on them to, so they can be identified. Uh, this is Major Anter Ohawa, who was a Finnish born army officer uh, who, had, who had been recruited in fact by the US Army as a cold weather expert and had become an American citizen and, and so on. And he had experience in, in these tractor train operations in Greenland. So he was the leader of the party and deputy leader and navigator was a chief warrant officer. <clears throat> so here we are at Bird getting ready to go and I should possibly tell you also that of the 11 people who were on the field party, five were winter overs from Bird Station and six were, uh, came down before the season, and so there was Major Havala, the leader, and the navigator, and three uh, bulldozer drivers. And the, the six of us from Bird were, were uh, Cook, two radio operators, uh, the chief mechanic. for everybody and a lot of people sort of objected to wearing them. They thought it was silly. But here we are at the departure time and uh, I won't bother to identify the people who wouldn't be anything. So here is the tractor train and it consisted of two Caterpillar tractors, uh, one pulling two 20-ton sleds with essentially the load was fuel. There were a lot of bamboo stakes as well for purposes of keeping a straight line when navigating. And the second bulldozer had the two wanigans, one of a uh, sleeping wanigan and the other a uh, cooking and eating one wanigan. And uh, there were two uh, weasels for navigation purposes, and one was on a 10-ton sled being drawn by the, uh, the 
caterpillar tractors and the other one led the way and it was the navigation vehicle. These things travel at about two miles an hour and uh, we traveled all day, uh, you know, so, so something like eight in the morning to eight in the evening. And uh, our average speed was in fact 23.7 miles per day. So that works out about right, two miles an hour to 12 hours. Of course, there were stops in between as well. And here we are departing Bird Station in the background. First stop on the trail, and you could see what I just described, the sled, the sled train on the right, the two 20-ton sleds, and on the left, the Wanigans and the spare weasel. <coughs> this is a mess Wanigan and Major Havala is making water. Uh, this sort of looks like, a, I'm not quite sure what, how, how to pronounce it, but how to describe it, but it strikes me that everyone looks sort of uh, exhausted, I don't know, like the right word. This is a sleeping Lonigan, uh, three deep, uh, three deck, th three bed uh, tiers. Uh, Forrest Dowling with his two gravity meters. This is a result of his work. Uh, I made the drawing, but it's his work, and you can see the surface elevation from altimetry and the bottom elevation from uh, the gravity survey. And this is me doing half of my job, which was weather observations. Apparently there was some weather right there at that time. <laughs> and the other half was Glaciological pit, and so I have a sequence here of uh, digging the pit, which took a couple of hours. And what I did was uh, start digging after we stopped in the evening and had a, a meal. And it took me more or less the whole night to do the job. And uh, I slept during the travel during the days, most of the time. <clears throat> so here is a very nice fancy scale that I made. This is centimeters to measure where the tubes, the density tubes were put in. I also uh, had thermometers and, and measured temperatures down the pit. You'll see in the following slide that there is a two by four marked with uh, 10 centimeter intervals, and that's because this thing fell off the sled somewhere and <laughs> found it. And the standard technique for, uh, for a pit was to make density measurements that overlap using these cylinders. You, you knew the tear weight of the cylinders, and as this is a dietetic scale, measured the, weighed the thing, and then computed the amount of snow and, and so on. <clears throat> then we had crevasse drill, and we used one of my pits one day to everybody to practice climbing out of falling into a hole. Here we are on a trail of more or less whiteout conditions. And uh, you can see this bamboo pole here on the right. That was the means of navigation was to establish a position by uh, <laughs> solar observations, astronomic position, and then pick a direction to go in 
start out in that direction and the navigator would look back and line up these poles every quarter of a mile he had a pole uh, that's why there were so many poles on that uh, sled and <coughs> this is a uh, blizzard condition just to show that there were we didn't have any really serious severe weather just an occasional thing like this in the last of the day and that's the result of all that wind the place is pretty well buried. Uh, some of the phenomena, by the way, you notice the 48 star flag down here. <coughs> that was before there were 50 states in the, I think they actually were, but this was an old flag. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this was uh, the circumzenithal arc that appeared and I managed to get a picture of it. The flag is there to blot out the sun. And then this was a uh, solar, what's the word I want? Uh, anyway, the, 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 sorry. The phenomenon is down here, and the sun is, of course, very bright. Uh, it's not a sun dog, but uh, anyway, it's a phenomenon caused by uh, crystals in the atmosphere. And there's the navigator doing uh, celestial observation with using a field light. Then we had a mail delivery. And uh, this was a marine pilot. He came in probably, what, 10 feet above the Bonnegan and dropped some mail. Then Christmas, your uh, Major Havala distributed a, a menu that Scott's party had on Christmas Day, and then we had this enormous feed uh, as in contrast. And, uh, the, the fellow on the right is the cook, and the fellow on the left is one of the radio men. Among other things, we had schnapps made from pure alcohol, as far as I know. They mixed it here in the, in the galley. <laughs> <laughs> and here we're getting to the Peel Mountains on the horizon there. And this happens to be one of the rougher places, a, a downward downhill uh, track. And uh, this is about as close as we came to the mountains. And by the way, I should say that uh, the distance from 80 degrees south to the pole, 10 degrees of latitude is 600 nautical miles and 690 statute miles but it was not possible to go straight down the meridian because mountains were in the way. And then after we got past the mountain and up on the plateau, uh, somebody saw this little hole and the powers that be realized that we were in a crevasse field. And here's a view of one of the crevasses, very small. You can see Forrest Dowling looking down. Uh, he turned on, and of course everything came to a screeching halt. This was at, uh, let's see what the, got it here. to see what was the best way to get out of there and uh, circled around and dropped some 
directions and said, go that way and you'll be out of it in a couple of miles. And so we did that. And after the fact, uh, I put on a crevasse detector on the weasel. This, this was after the D8 had detected the crevasse. So here's my two by four replacement for my nice plexiglass scale. And you can see in my two meter pit, there's an incipient crevasse starting at the bottom there. And it, it turned out that, that we were, it, that we had crossed the junction between uh, the solid ice cap and a filled in very large crevasse and we were on the, on the one edge of it. So uh, what we did is Major Avila and I, who were the only two people in the party who had ever skied before, uh, I went down one side of this large crevasse and Major Avila went down on the other side of the crevasse and we just sort of pointed the way where, you know, the, the place to avoid, and got out of it in a couple of miles, five, eight miles, something like that. That's just to show the very large Satsuki that we encountered. Uh, you know, this, this was, uh, it was interesting that the, the surface varied all over the place, from completely smooth and soft to things like this. Here's another shot. You notice that there's, this is intended to show that the Sestrubi are on the order of 70 centimeters high, so that's pretty good. Then we came to mile 700, and uh, we put out, believe it or not, there are only six poles here, but here's the seventh one growing out of Chief Davis's head. So this was mile 700, and I eventually, two years later when I was on a field party from Pole, uh, among others, I remeasured the stakes that, that we had put in the two years before as far as we went along this track. And it's just to show that I got back to our old mile 700. And uh, we got within seeing distance of the pole. We were maybe two miles to the right, in, in, as the track goes, from actually hitting the station head on. We had a welcoming committee come out, informal of course, and this is a tractor from the Hillary party that uh, reached the pole in 58, I think it was. So this is the obligatory visit and circling of the pole actual geographic pole, which was supposed to be right there. <coughs> we had a formal picture. And notice Chief Davis here. Uh, and this was his way of objecting to having to wear this blue uh, bird cloth outfit. And Notice also that there are three people missing in this picture. They were there, but they didn't want to bother to come have their picture taken for something. And a few shots here of the pole station. And here you, there is a 50 star flag. So <clears throat> it existed at the time. And the usual humorous signs, so many miles to here and there the entrance to the station and the Raywood Tower that's uh, 
radar which tracks weather balloons. Uh, this looked very much like an over here, just barely visible as the Aurora Tower. Uh, very similar to what we had left at Bird, same kind of environment and construction. This says, welcome to the South Pole Station. See its most important feature, the snow mine. Feel its frigid hospitality. Hear the strange noises of the snow worms. Smell its fragrant aroma. Taste its century-old melted snow. And something, nothing less, anyway, attempt at humor. And it, this is, typical of the way the stations uh, were constructed. The, the buildings were placed a certain distance apart and then roofed over. And as the years went by, people had to put in sort of jury rig supports to keep uh, the roofs in place. quarters. This is the snow mine they wanted you to look at. This was done in the uh, IGY and I don't know the, the depth but it went down about at a 45 degree angle and something on the order of 50 meters perhaps. A time capsule that was kept at the coal station and Forest Dowling taking a picture. <clears throat> and then there was time to go home. Uh, C-130 came in, the weasel was driven onto it, and we all piled in and flew back to McMurdo. This is the Beardmore Glacier. And here is a little bit of science uh, show you the room from Bird and you can see here the world mountains in the way going straight and the field mountains that we crossed and then this little jog is the crevasse area that I showed and notice here that we missed the pole by is a mile or two, but we could see it. So it's pretty good navigation. And uh, this is a result of the pit work. Temperature decreases toward the pole. This is bird, this is pole over here. Accumulation, for some reason, goes up there and then decreases toward the pole, which is correct. This is just the elevation to show the topography that may be the part of the controlling reason for the accumulation and temperature being what it is, temperature going down as the elevation increases. <clears throat> this was a result of the measurements that I was able to make in 62.3 on the stakes that I put in, in on the travers and the circles are the accumulation measurements from the poles and the X in the box are the accumulation determined from my snow pits. You can see there's quite a lot of scatter but there is a definite trend as well. And to end the show, we got a mention in the New York Times, U.S. ground team is at South Pole. So there you go. Thank you very much for your attention. You have to show us who you are, which oh, ones you are. By the way, I didn't people. say that I'd be happy to take questions, whether I can answer them or not, is another issue. What did they do with the uh, Caterpillar tractors down at the South Pole? Uh, they're, 
They needed them for construction of a new pole station. Oh, okay. And they left them there then? Yeah. They, they yeah. never took them back out? Uh, <laughs> did they probably not. Did they shut them down? I mean, the, the, the way the Navy operated, you know, I mean, this was at a time when the, you know, all the support was military, Navy, and typically of, of military thinking or, or way of operating a lot of that was an awful lot of waste uh, and so on and I'm not saying that the bulldozers were wasted but I don't think there was ever any attempt to recycle them. Right. right. Uh, just to follow up I had the feeling that you know that type of equipment runs forever. Yeah. And oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, and once they put in the, the 1974 station, which was above ground, yeah. there was constant, uh, you know, gardening and, and landscaping around. And those th those uh, <coughs> those uh, uh, caterpillars would run. I mean, they would landscape 24 hours no. a day. Oh yeah, and they leave them running. Okay. Speak up a little bit. Yeah, I'm working with some students to edit a journal from uh, Ernest Lockhart, chapter 1939 1941. Um, the United States I still can't hear you out. On the extreme left. If Well, 
the driver is the cook, the, the leader, the chief mechanic, uh, another bulldozer driver, radio man, another bulldozer driver, and three people are missing. <coughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Henry, whatever happened to that time capsule? You know, is it still in the pole? <laughs> <laughs> no idea, but uh, it was placed there, presumably, just to, to be there in perpetuity until you know, the world collapses. <laughs> yeah. So, what was the temperature in the sleeping quarters? Uh, that's, I thought I was going to get that question, uh, and I really don't know. I, I was a guy who, who measured the temperatures because I, I did the meteorology, so-called. But I can't, I, I don't have a record, and I, I don't remember what it was. But in general, it, it wasn't particularly cold, and certainly not by Antarctic standards. Did you, did you stop the tractor? Did you stop the movement if you were out in the blizzard, or did you just get going? Oh, no, we stopped in stopped. the blizzard. Yeah. David? Uh, Henry, you, you had a slide with your science on it and the elevation on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Where was the steel mountains on that elevation traverse? I think I, it's the second I'm last. I'm not sure whether they're on there or not. No, they, they weren't marked. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I can tell you approximately where they oh, are. No, 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 it was the next to last slide, I think. Right. Oh. Oops, we're going the wrong way. That's right. <coughs> Sorry about that. Well, Just gone by. Yeah. So, oh, that's the trans <coughs> where part of the